And we're so pleased to have Dr. Prusak uh, give our 3 o'clock presentation. And Dr. Kelly will be giving our 4.30 presentation in the cinema. Uh, Dr. Prusak was a professor of mine uh, uh, when I was doing graduate work, and um, I couldn't get enough of him. I kept taking a course, and then a course, and then a course. Uh, I tell the undergraduate students, you really should not leave Villanova without taking a course in theology with Dr. Prusak. He is a revered and well-loved uh, professor here, and I am so pleased and honored to introduce you to him uh, through this presentation on uh, Nostra Atate. So without any further ado, Dr. Prusak. Thank you, Kathy. Congratulations on the good work over these many years in that program. Uh, Nostra Aetate has an interesting history. And uh, at the risk of boring you, I'd like to take you through that history because I think you get an insight into how the church finally came to something totally new. And it was really serendipitous that they did. And so I've reconstructed the kind of history of this particular document and shows you uh, a kind of unfolding. I think it will fit into the later talk also. On October 28, 1958, the cardinals assembled in conclave after the death of Pope Pius XII elected Angelo Roncalli as pope. Many regarded him as a transitional pope, little realizing that this pontificate of a man of 76 years would mark a turning point in history and initiate a new age for the church. The turning point came on January 25, 1959, less than three months after his election, when John XXIII announced his intention to convene the Second Vatican Council. Pope John characterized his goal for the council as aggiornamento, or updating of the church. Two months later, John XXIII also took another initiative of revising the Good Friday prayer for Jews. He deleted the Latin adjective perfidus in the or exhortation or ramus et pro perfidis judeis. We're having problems in the back. Here we go. Okay. I just, should I stand back for a No, closer. Yeah, closer. closer? Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Two, I'll repeat the sentence. Two months later, John the Twenty-Third also took the initiative of revising the Good Friday prayer for Jews. He deleted the Latin adjective perfidus in the exhortation oremus et pro perfidis judeis, let us pray for the unbelieving Jews, that is, unbelieving in Christ, and also removed the expression perfidia judaica. Through unfamiliarity with the Latin of, of Christian antiquity, the terms had been wrongly translated in various modern languages by similar sounding words like perfidious and perfidy which convey very negative connotations, such as treacherous. Another measure taken in the same year was a modification of parts of a prayer dedicating humanity to Jesus. Earlier, during the Second World War, as the Vatican's apostolic delegate in Bulgaria and Turkey, then Bishop Roncalli kept himself informed of the horrors of Nazi extermination camps and the anguish of Jews threatened with deportation to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. It's reported that he wanted to know all the details concerning deportation orders that he could find out. He then saw to it personally that they were dealt with. In this way, it is reported he succeeded in preventing deportations from Slovakia, Hungary, and Bulgaria. His purging of hateful words, of hurtful words, and expressions from liturgical texts when he became pope thus stands in continuity with earlier concerns and activity. That continuity is likewise evident in another initiative. On September 18, 1960, Pope John personally commissioned Cardinal Augustin Bea in his capacity as president of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity to prepare a draft declaration on the interrelations between the church and the Jewish people. It should be noted that on April 24, 1960, a document signed by the rector and 18 professors, all Jesuits, of Rome's Biblical Institute was sent to the Council's Central Preparatory Commission, the group charged with shaping the agenda for the Council. The last paragraph of their submission's dogmatic section contained the proposal entitled On the Avoidance of Anti-Semitism. Similar proposals came from other institutes and study groups. The first meeting of the Secretariat for Christian Unity took place on November 14th and 15th, 1960. 
Cardinal Bea announced that Pope John had entrusted the Secretariat with considering the questions posed for the church in connection with the Jews. The, title for, the proposed title for the preparatory text was Questions Concerning the Jews. An Augustinian, Gregory Baum, was charged with preparing a short summary which was then discussed at the second meeting on February 6th to 9th, 1961 in Aricia near Rome. The survey emphasized that the teaching of re recent popes was made, made clear that the Christian approach to the Jewish question was a theological one and that certain patristic and medieval conceptions of the Jews were no longer to be defended. In order to dispel the flood of anti-Semitism, it proposed that the council should issue authoritative declarations on various points. Such initial steps soon encountered opposition. Cardinal Bea had a conversation that he presumed to be confidential with a journalist who considered an interview to be made public. When the plans for pronouncement on the Jews became known, Arab governments vigorously reacted, having concluded that it would be politically advantageous to the state of Israel. You have to remember this is 50 years ago. What was intended as a pastoral and theological document thus became a political hot potato. It generated representations by diplomats accredited to the Holy See and numerous unfriendly articles in Arab newspapers. When Vatican diplomats realized they couldn't convince Arab leaders that the pronouncement would be theological and in no way political, they became uneasy. Some began to ask whether such a pronouncement should even be made. It even became unclear whether the Central Commission, the highest organ of the Council, would permit an independent decree or whether the pronouncements on Jews would be incorporated in other or several other documents. At times it was doubtful whether there would be a Council pronouncement at all. At a third meeting of the Subcommission on April 6th to the 21st, 1961, the Chair, Abbot Leo Rudolph of Benedictine, spoke to the problems being encountered and stressed the importance of, quote, seizing the God-given moment to speak in an ecumenical spirit of the people of whom Christ was born in his humanity. The subcommission thus proceeded to discuss and revise the preliminary study that had been prepared. The resulting revised draft had three parts. The first part dealt with dogmatic principles. In the second section, it spoke of Jews as those forever favored by God. The second part treated moral and liturgical uh, considerations. The third part offered concrete proposals, which included removal of portrayals of the ritual murder legends in stone or paintings still found in some church buildings in Europe. There was a legend that Jews killed young Jewish males and then offered, uh, young Christian males rather, and offered them as sacrifices, a completely unfounded legend. But it also made its way into some of the paintings and sculptures in Christian churches. The draft was then presented to the fourth general meeting of the Secretariat for Unity in Buell, Germany in August 1961. The discussion at that meeting included the question whether the Jewish people still had a role in salvation history and whether it was important to go beyond the text's refutation of the phrase, a people of deicides, that word which was used in past history, God killers, and it was used as a motivation for persecuting Jews and explained that the accusation was absolutely rejected as an outright slander. In November 1961, there was another plenary or full session of the entire Secretariat for Unity. The agenda again concluded questions related to the Jews. One member proposed two possible ways of proceeding, a council proclamation against anti-Semitism or a declaration on the dignity of all humans in their likeness to God. In the latter framework, there could be a special reference to Jews at which Arabs could not take offense. Some suggested preparing texts that could be inserted into the document on the church or on religious liberty. Others, however, however, emphasized the need to present a text bearing the seal of the Secretariat for Unity. Three-fifths of the members thought a theoretical and practical declaration concerning the Jews could be worked out. It was also unanimously agreed that supplementary proposals should be given to the Theological Commission of the Council and to the other subcommissions within the Secretariat on tolerance and on religious freedom. The first draft of a decree on the Jews was worked out during the General Assembly that met from November 27th to December 2nd, 1961. The preliminary work was thus concluded and the draft could be presented to the bishops when they convened for the council in October of 1962. The draft was submitted to the General Preparatory Commission charged with reviewing and distributing all documents. 
but another setback exploded during the summer of 1962. On June 12th, the president of the World Jewish Congress announced that it was intending to, intended to dispatch Dr. Chaim Wardy, a senior official from the Ministry of Religious Affairs in the State of Israel, to Rome as a representative of the Congress. As the Jewish Congress later explained, it was a question of putting into practice the basic principle of having representatives in the world's most important capitals, Rome being one of them. Dr. Wardy was to serve the Congress as advisor on Christian affairs that also concerned Jews, without there being intended for him any special role in relation to the Vatican or the Vatican Council. The Arab governments, however, let loose a storm of protest against the seemingly preferential treatment of Jews. Because of the political circumstances, the Central Preparatory Commission decided to remove the draft decree on the Jews from the Council's agenda. That decision could have, left to the, could have led to the question never being taken up again. On the eve of the Council's opening, the Chief Rabbi of Rome addressed a message to the Council bishops advocating that they follow the example of Pope John and attend to the question of Jews. Cardinal Bea, the head of the Secretariat, sent an appeal to Pope John that the decree be restored to the Council's agenda. A move was made to incorporate the statement into the decree on ecumenism. With some minor modifications and stylistic changes, the draft was rebranded as draft now number two, as chapter four of the decree on ecumenism. In this form, it was not given to the bishops until November 8, 1963. The council started in early October. On November 18, 1963, the leaders of the Eastern churches living in Arab countries expressed fiery opposition to the chapter. The speakers included Cardinal Tapuni, Patriarch of the Syriac Rite at Antioch, the Coptic Patriarch, Stephanos I of Alexandria in Egypt, the Melkite Patriarch of Antioch, Maximus IV. The opposition continued into the next day in speeches by the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, Alberto Guri, and the Armenian Patriarch of Cilicia, Peter XVI. These bishops were obviously concerned about repercussions for Christians living in Arab countries. A number of Western bishops welcomed the statement about Jews, but thought it might be placed in a different context. Some proposed attaching it to the schema on the church in the modern world. Another meeting of the Secretariat for Unity was held from February 24th to March 6th, 1964. That's after the second session. A new third draft was produced, which omitted and watered down the elements that vexed those oppo opposed to the document. The new draft was now likewise downgraded to being an appendix to the schema on ecumenism. Someone leaked the test text to the press in America, and it then spread throughout the world. On September 25, 1964, Cardinal Bea formally presented the Declaration on Jews and Non-Christians in the Council Chamber. He noted that many would judge the Council by the stand it took on this question. He said that the changes to the draft submitted during the second session were explained by the fact that the Secretariat had thoroughly reconsidered the suggestions made by the Council bishops and made careful use of them. He hinted that the Coordinating Commission also had had an input. The treatment of the so-called question of deicide, God killer, had been considerably altered. The Cardinal emphasized that this assertion could not be sustained but that it was nevertheless indisputable that in the course of history, the notion of a universal Jewish guilt had led many Christians, quote, to consider and designate the Jews with whom they lived as members of a race rejected and cursed by God for deicide, and so to despise or even persecute them. For this reason, Jews now expected a solemn condemnation by the council of such an attitude. Jesus was condemned to death by the leadership in Jerusalem, not by all the Jews. Cardinal Bea underscored that it's not acceptable to indict the people of those times for the crimes of their leaders, nor to blame the Jewish people of today for actions of their ancestors 1900 years ago. In the great debate that followed, a number of German, American, Canadian bishops offered strong support for the statement on the Jews. But another crisis emerged in October, it was unending. Despite the broad support expressed in the conciliar debate, a group within the Vatican who were opposed to the Declaration, sought to impose a re-examination of the Declaration by a committee that they could control. The intention was to abbreviate the statement and then incorporate a weakened statement into the document on the church. 
Some surmised that the move was a response to the pressures coming from Eastern bishops in Arab countries, who argued that the declaration about Jews was inopportune given the political tensions over the state of Israel and the Palestinian refugee situation. The move to re-examine and recast the declaration would have circumvented the rules of the council and caused widespread dismay. Pope Paul VI, Pope John had died at the end of the first session, and so now the Pope was Paul VI, supposedly assured Cardinal Bea that the document would be neither amputated nor diminished. In what followed, the declaration would be recast, but not in the manner intended by the opposition. It would be expanded rather than abbreviated. It was opened to a broader horizon. During the great debate of the third session, several bishops had expressed the wish that the Declaration on the Jews should be given a wider application so that the new spirit of encounter would extend not only to Jews but to all non-Christians. This had also been suggested during the second session in 1963 by Cardinals Bueno y Monreal of Spain and Doi of Japan, and most vigorously by Bishop de la Vega Cotujino of India. In the third session in 1964, the idea of a declaration which would include all religions was represented mainly by Bishop Plumery of Cameroons, the Maronite Bishop Sfair of Lebanon, Descufi of Turkey, Nage of Japan, and Nguyen Van Heen of Vietnam. A number of African bishops desired that animism also be expressly mentioned. Many bishops emphasized the value of all spiritual experience. The Secretariat had not previously incorporated such perspectives. Its members felt that the Secretariat for Unity was not authorized to produce such a declaration and had neither competence nor the experts needed for drafting a declaration on the all-embracing salvific will of God and his saving work among the nations. After the great debate of the third session, however, <clears throat> excuse me, the Secretariat began to appoint a number of special temporary commissions to which belonged, among others, George Anawadi from Egypt, Yves Congar from France, Charles Merler, and Yosef Neuner, who had worked as a Jesuit in India. The proposed expansion was foreshadowed in serendipitous ways. In his opening speech at the beginning of the second session of the Council in 1963, Pope Paul VI had himself spoken of the Catholic Church looking beyond the frontiers of Christianity. Quote, how could she limit her love as she is to imitate the love of the Divine Father who gives his good things to all humans and so loves the world that he gave his only son for its salvation? Thus she looks, that is, the Church, looks beyond her own sphere to the other religions which have preserved the sense of the divine and the idea of the one supreme and transcendent creator and preserver. These religions venerate God by sincere acts of piety, a piety which, like their convictions, form the foundations of their moral and social life. In February 1964, the Secretariat for Christian Unity and several bishops had received a memorandum from the American Institute for Jewish Christian Relations, or Jewish Christian Studies, rather. It had been formulated by Dr. Barry Olanoff of Columbia University in New York. The memorandum stated that it was not only suitable, but indeed necessary, that the Council should celebrate the variety as well as the essential unity of the inner experiences of humankind. It was the task of the church gladly to praise every just deed, every just human, every loving deed, every loving human, every opening of a soul to God, every movement of the heart, however weak, which announces the goodness of God and the goodness of humans toward each other. The recognition of religious experiences outside its own sphere does not mean that the church does not realize the great differences between itself and those who do not believe in Christ. But by affirming the work of the spirit who blows where it wills, it can also deepen its own asceticism and piety, its own sympathy and its own incessant prayer. At the same time, it shows itself as the faithful companion and intercessor for all those who seek permanent peace. In his Easter message of March 29, 1964, Pope Paul VI proclaimed, every religion contains a ray of the light which we must neither despise nor extinguish, even though it is not sufficient to give the human the truth he needs, or to realize the miracle of the Christian life in which truth and life coalesce. But every religion raises us towards the transcendent being, the sole ground of all existence and all thought, of all responsible action and all authentic hope. 
On Pentecost Sunday, May 17th, 1964, this is between the third and fourth session of the Council, Pope Paul VI instituted a special department of the Roman Curia for relation with peoples of other religions. Known at first as the Secretariat for Non-Christians, in 1988 it was renamed the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Should be noted, however, that the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Inter Dialogue doesn't have responsibility for Jewish-Christian relations, which was kept in the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity. In his first encyclical, Ecclesiam Suam, on August 6, 1964, again between the two sessions, the third and the final or fourth session of the Council, the Pope emphasized the task of the Church to enter into dialogue with the others. He said, then we see another circle around us. This too is vast in, an extent, in its extent. It's made up of humans who above all adore the one supreme God whom we too adore. We refer briefly to the Hebrew people worthy of our affection and respect then to the adorers of God according to the conception of monotheism, the Muslim religion especially, etc., and also to the followers of the great Afro-Asiatic religions. John Osterreicher has observed in his history of the text that the idea to give the declaration on the Jews, a Catholic that is universal, in Greek the word katholike means universal, a Catholic or universal framework embracing the whole earth was tremendously advanced by Pope Paul VI's plan to attend the Eucharistic Congress at Bombay in early December 1964, just after the end of the third session. A fourth and large draft of the Declaration, which also incorporated some of the revisions proposed by bishops during the debate of the third session, was rapidly prepared through intensive work by members of the Secretariat. In that process, the statement on Jews became section or Article 4 of the now expanded and renamed Declaration on the Relationship of the Church to Non-Christian Religions. The new fourth draft was then expeditiously approved in the first reading. The bishops got it, got a chance to look at it, and immediately they took a vote. Expeditiously approved by a wide margin on November 20th, 1964. The vote on sections 1 to 3, which dealt with the preface and then uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, was 1838 yes, 136 no, no, with 13 invalid votes. The vote on sections 4 to 5, which dealt with the Jews, was 1770 yes, 185 no, 14 invalid votes. Invalid votes is when a bishop forgot to sign his document and indicate which seat he was in, etc. The vote on the document as a whole was 1651 yes, 242 yes, but with proposed amendments. A bishop could vote uh, yes. Uh, he could vote uh, yes, juxta modem, which meant he had to propose an amendment, and then he could vote no. So in the overall vote, the bishops voted 1651 yes, Plachet, it pleases, uh, 242 no, and proposed amendments 99. Um, in the interim between the beginning of the, between the end of the third session and the beginning of the fourth session, um, the, the text underwent a few but important further revisions. Um, between the third and fourth sessions of the Council, the Declaration was a continuing source of anxiety in Arab countries. Some worried that Catholics in those countries would for, perhaps face serious harassment. In the Arab states, diplomatic offensives multiplied with the support, advice, and help of the bishops and patriarchs of these countries who furnished biblical objections and other religious motives to counter the declaration. Two of the bishops from these countries were members of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, where opinions were thus divided. A very small minority of bishops within the council found it difficult to give up ancient prejudices which so easily disguise themselves as the sacred tradition of the church. Some interventions in the conciliar debates wrongly argued that by renouncing the term deicide, God killers, the church was beginning to dissociate herself from the divinity of Christ. That wasn't the intention at all, but you could see I could twist that argument. Some exploited such arguments and facts of this kind in their outspoken opposition to the declaration. As a result, the secretariat, already internally divided on the question of deicide, found itself forced to modify the text far beyond what the bishop's vote required and allowed. In the debate within the secretariat, the American cardinal, Sheehan, felt that the rejection of the accusation of deicide should not be omitted. Deicide had become a key word, a symbol of all the Jews had ever been accused of. 
it was a word which might only too easily be misunderstood. He was also firmly convinced that by excising those words, the document would be emasculated and its effect would be seriously weakened. He asked from his heart that the text should be retained as it stood and as it had been approved by the overwhelming majority of the bishops of the council in the third session. But the accounts reaching Rome from the Middle East became ever more frightening. It was said that the final acceptance of the declaration on the Jews would lead to serious attacks on the Christian minorities. There remained the possibility that the declaration would be quietly dropped. In the situation, a number of bishops and advisors asked to speak within the Secretariat. One of the most stirring interventions was that of the German Bishop of Würzburg, Josef Stengel, who spoke on the 12th of May, noting that he came from the country of Hochnuth, the author of the deputy. Remember, that's the play that accused Pius XII of not doing enough to prevent uh, the uh, deportation and killing of Jews. He said that what was at stake was the credibility of the church. The whole world knew that the decree had already been accepted by the fathers. The whole world was waiting for its promulgation. The whole council was enjoying an ex extraordinary reception and the greatest respect because of its openness, its honesty, and because it was no respecter of persons. If our decree were not to be promulgated, everybody would be asking, why not? The reply, diplomatic considerations or something, would appear as a sign of weakness. It would be a defeat of the church before the whole world. Bishop Stengel continued, it's not only a question of the credibility of the church, but also of her claim to moral leadership. The speech lay bare the difficult situation of the bishops and the importance of their decision. They could no longer attempt easy solutions, and no one would try to get rid of the obstinate problem by dropping the declaration altogether. But the struggle about individual phrases continued. Time and time again, theologians attempted to get, the, to get rid of the condemnation of the deicide formula, but all efforts came to nothing until suddenly one day a two-thirds majority was actually found in favor of eliminating the relevant words. The majority had become convinced that an obstinate clinging to the text would endanger all ecumenical efforts in the Middle East and would destroy all hope of a reunion of the churches of East and West or at least of closing the wounds of centuries. One has to, I didn't mention this, but many of the Eastern Orthodox churches also began to react to the document from that part of the world. The Secretary had explained in its explanation response to the um, amendments proposed by the bishops that the term deicide could be removed because it didn't belong to the actual substance of the text. For the idea was already contained in the pre preceding sentences in which a collective guilt of the Jews is expressly denied and the view that they are rejected or cursed by God is decisively rejected. So they drop that word, but they put in those statements. The following reasons were given for the omission of the phrase guilty of deicide. Whatever the context in which the word deicide occurs, it has a hateful sound. Hence, terms like deicide and others must be removed altogether from the Christian vocabulary. The term has led to wrong theological interpretations and cause difficulties in pastoral work as well as in ecumenical dialogue with some churches. If I could just pause for one moment. Um, I worked in the council in the final session, in the fourth session, and I uh, was completing my graduate studies, my, my doctoral studies in Rome at that time, and I was assigned a section of the bishops uh, to, di to distribute documents and to collect their votes during the council. And on my shelf at home, I have uh, five bound volumes of all the documents that I distributed during that year. That was the year of 1965. And this is what the bishops got in the fourth session from the secretariat. Um, it was the, the schema, because that meant it had not yet been approved, the schema of the declaration on the relationship of uh, the church to uh, non-Christian religions. And then what it had in it is here is the draft that the, was hurriedly written in the third session of the council, which was the expanded draft, which now got the new name on the relationship of the church to non-Christian religions. And then in the right-hand side is the revision of that. This is the fourth draft, the final and revised draft of that being the fifth draft that had been worked on between the end of the third session and the beginning of the fourth session. And then 
after that, where those two were put side by side so the bishops could see all the changes. In other words, they could compare. In other words, here something was added. Other places something was dropped out. So they could go through it and they could also see where uh, the change was made on, the, on the, the theme of deicide. That's right here, where here there was the mention of the deicide. Here it disappeared, but they could check the way it was placed. And then along with that came uh, a report of the votes at the previous session and then a little explanation of how the commission, how the secretary proceeded in everything, uh, in, in the revision from between the fourth and the fifth draft of the, of the document. And then after that, it provided each of the modi, as they were known in Latin, or the amendments proposed. If a bishop voted yes, but juxta modem, he then had to submit a document that uh, gave his, his amendment proposal. In some cases, bishops, for example, one of the amendments here that got a lot of attention was one proposed by 30 bishops, but it was rejected because they were, mis they were reading the scriptures in a way that, the, that was not considered acceptable. They were part of that little minority uh, that was in the council. And so then the document goes through each of the amendments that the bishops gave and uh, in that regard uh, explains whether it was accepted or not accepted uh, during the course of the of the discussion of the secretariat. Uh, and it, it proceeds through in that way so that you can see uh, every, every particular modem that, uh, that was submitted and then whether they accepted it or not accepted. In this particular section, I have it marked up because it's now 20 years ago, I wrote an article for the Journal of Ecumenical Studies on Jews and the death of Jesus before and after Vatican II and I analyzed a number of these uh, modi or these amendments that were uh, given uh, to the bishops and the responses that were there. Before the declaration could be promulgated, some difficulties still had to be overcome. In order to facilitate the voting and make it as reliable as possible, this is the voting now on that second column, the right-hand column, which is the fifth and final draft of the document, and to make it as reliable as possible, the secretary had arranged that eight individual points should be submitted to the vote. Uh, the ninth or final vote then was on the document as a whole, and then on the day that the document was promulgated, there was another vote on the whole document and agreement that it should be promulgated. Uh, the result of the voting, which was on the 14th and 15th of October, and I remember these days because I found myself distributing and then gathering and distributing and gathering uh, these documents. The first vote was on the preface, and the bishops voted 2,185 were voting, 20, 2,071 voted yes, or Plachet, and 110 voted non-Plachet. Uh, in the section on Hinduism and Buddhism, um, uh, 1,923 voted yes, Plachet, and 184 non-Plachet. You could see that constant minority. Uh, on Islam, 20, um, 1916 voted uh, yes, and 189 voted no. On the spiritual roots of uh, the church and Christianity in Judaism, that was number four, 1937 voted yes, 153 no. Uh, on rejecting the collective guilt of Jews for the death of Jesus, uh, 1875 voted yes, 888 voted no. Uh, on the fact that Jews are not cursed or rejected by God, 1821 bishops voted yes, 245 voted no. On the fact that in instruction and sermons there should be no prejudice and they should be free of prejudice about the Jews and they should uh, articulate correctly that not all Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, etc. Uh, the vote was 1905 yes, 199 no. And on the final section that um, there should be a non-exclusive universal brotherhood of all human beings no matter what religion they belong to, 2064 voted yes, 58 voted no. 2,023 fathers took part in the final voting on the whole draft. 1,763 voted in favor, 250 voted against it, and 10 votes were invalid. Uh, 250 negative votes was a comparatively high figure, but it represents not only opponents to the section on the Jews, but also dissatisfied with the text on Islam or Buddhism, or even missionary bishops who wanted a section on animism that never made it into the document. So the question is, who gave those 250 votes? Um, the 254 negative votes on question six, which was that Jews are not cursed or rejected by God, 
are more than those on the other questions. But in this question, there was another complexity, because some who voted against that one were the ones who were dismayed that they removed the word deicide and that they didn't oppose that. And it was very fortunate that not a huge number voted, because it could have bumped it up to a third of the council. And if you got it close to a third, well, by the rules of the council, if a third was opposed, they, they could have started to argue against the document. So it didn't reach that kind of uh, number. On October 28th, the day of the official promulgation, another solemn vote was taken. 2,312 bishops voted for, 88 against. And three votes were invalid. As usual, as was usual, Pope Paul VI spoke on the occasion of the solemn proclamation. He saw a sign of new life in the change represented by this declaration. Quote, the church is alive, he exclaimed. Well there, then, here is the proof, here is the breath, the voice, the song. The church lives, the church thinks, the church speaks, the church grows. We must take account of this astonishing phenomenon. We must realize its messianic significance. Paul VI hoped that the world too, especially the Christians separated from Rome, would contemplate the growth of the church and the new face that had become more beautiful. The same applied to the followers of other religions, among them especially those who are united to us in Abraham, which means the Jews. The Declaration holds a special place among the documents of Vatican II. In its original core, the Declaration concerning the Jews came from an express wish of John XXIII. But the final declaration went a great step beyond. In it, the council, for the first time in history, acknowledges the search for the absolute by other humans and by whole, whole races and peoples, and honors the truth and holiness in other religions as the work of the one living God. It is the first time also that the Catholic Church has publicly made her own the Pauline view of the mystery of Israel. To that extent, the declaration is an acknowledgment by the Catholic Church of the universal presence of grace and God's activity in the many religions of humankind. Wide though it is in its scope, it in no way obscures the uniqueness of God's dealings with Israel. In this declaration, the church glorifies God for enduring faithfulness towards God's chosen people, the Jews. Let me take just a couple of moments to just note a couple of parts of the statement itself. Part one, in our time when day by day humankind is being drawn closer together and the ties between different peoples are becoming stronger, the Church examines more closely her relationship to non-Christian religions. In her task of promoting unity and love among humans, indeed among nations, she considers above all in this declaration what humans have in common and what draws them to fellowship. Jumping a bit, humans expect from the various religions answers to the unsolved riddles of the human condition, which today, even as in former times, deeply stir the hearts of humans. What is it to be human? What's the meaning, the aim of our life? What's moral good? What is sin? Whence suffering and what purpose does it serve? What's the road to true happiness? What are death, judgment, and retribution after death? What finally is that ultimate irrepressible mystery which encompasses our existence? Whence do we come and where are we going? In Hinduism, humans contemplate the divine mystery and express it through an inexhaustible abundance of myths and thorough searching philosophical inquiry. They seek freedom from the anguish of our human condition, either through ascetical practices in profound meditation or, or profound meditation or a flight to God with love and trust. Buddhism in its various forms realizes the radical insufficiency of this changeable world. It teaches a way by which humans in a devout and confident spirit may be able either to acquire the state of perfect liberation or attain by their own efforts or through higher help supreme illumination. And then follows that remarkable statement, unthinkable in the church of previous centuries. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. It goes on to talk about the Muslims. They adore the one God, living and subsisting in himself, merciful and all-powerful. It acknowledges, in the course of centuries, not a few quarrels and hostilities have arisen between Christians and Muslims. This sacred synod urges all to forget the past and to work sincerely for mutual understanding and to preserve as well as to promote together for the benefit of all humankind, social justice and moral welfare, as well as peace and freedom. Thank you for your attention.
thank you very much. That was equal, uh, up to your usual excellent standard. That was wonderful. That really, really was very moving. Um, we're going to open this up for questions. Um, one of the things Dr. Prusak said, though, I'm going to start with this one question about um, now that we know whence we've come, uh, I would be interested in where you think we are now or where we're going. It, it, 50 years ago doesn't seem that long ago to me. And the older I get, the less it seems long ago. But it was quite radical during that time. We did not enter Protestant churches. We never entered a mosque or a Hindu temple or a Jewish synagogue or anything back then. Uh, and now all of these places have become very familiar to me personally. I wonder, though, where you think uh, uh, this radical statement that Vatican II had um, issued, how do you see where we're at with this? Do you think, um, what, what's your opinion on the lived experience of this uh, declaration? I guess in my talk, in my talk I decided to focus on um, the genesis of the document and then ultimately what it said and what it stated. Um, I also mentioned that in 1964, May, 6, May 17th, uh, Paul VI had um, uh, founded the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. And if you look on the Vatican website, you can uh, find that council. You have to look for it. And then what they give you is uh, all the documents and statements that they have issued over the years. Uh, for example, on the 25th anniversary of uh, Nostra Aetate, the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions, they issued a, a kind of statement, a clarifying statement on that. Uh, that's, that's one of the bigger ones that they issued. Um, there's all sorts of other messages. Um, uh, it's interesting, they're, they're listed in, in backwards order, okay, the, the more recent, going backwards. For example, the message for the end of Ramadan on the 3rd of August, 2012. The message to Buddhists for the Feast of Vesak on April 3rd, 2012. Uh, a, a very interesting document that was issued uh, here. This is from um, uh, January 25th to 28th in 2011. Um, this particular document, uh, Christian Witness in the multi, uh, in the multi-religious world. Um, and in it, it gives principles. Uh, Christians are called to adhere to the following principles in the dialogue. Uh, acting in God's love, Im imitating Jesus, Christian virtues, acts of service and justice, discernment in ministries of healing, rejection of violence, um, freedom of, religious, of religion and belief, mutual respect and solidarity, respect for all people, renouncing false witness, ensuring personal discernment, building interreligious dialogue. And then uh, recommendations, the, the key letters of the recommendations, I'll just give those. Uh, the the uh, first one starts study, the second one starts build relationships, the third one encourage, the fourth one cooperate with other religious communities, the fifth one call on governments to ensure their freedom, and the sixth one pray for their neighbors and their well-being. So it's kind of the, the 2011 statement is, is um, it get, give some guidelines for, for relationships. But it, after that, you have message, message to Hindus for the Feast of Diwali, message for the end of Ramadan, I guess, to Buddhists. And so there's, there's these constant uh, messages that are there, and then various addresses that are given, et cetera, communiques on interreligious dialogue. Um, there's one particular one that's interesting. Uh, that's in this one, going through these. This one is from April 15, 2002. And this is a declaration from the Islamic Catholic Liaison Committee on the current situation in the Holy Land. Uh, this one almost goes over into the Jewish-Christian issue, which is really the territory of the other uh, council, the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity. Um, one other thing that should be mentioned is this document. This document came out August 6, 2000. And this is from when Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict, was head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And this is a, a not uncontroversial document. It's a document entitled, it's a declaration entitled Dominus Jesus, Lord Jesus, on the unicity and salvific universality of Jesus Christ in the church. And this document is expressing great concern that some people are starting to see all religions as relatively equal, et cetera, et cetera, and not giving enough attention to the unique um, mission of Jesus and the importance of the church, et cetera. Um, 
in this document also they stuck in the section it's a, especially section 16 to 17 deal with Protestant churches and 20 to 22 with other religions but in that 16 to 17 it caused kind of a, a, a little tiff within certain circles in, within the Vatican because it, it uh, touches the fact of as another document did from the Congregation of Faith it raises the question of of the kind of um, deficiencies that exist in Protestant churches because they don't have apostolic succession, therefore don't have valid ministry, therefore don't have valid Eucharist. And uh, Cardinal Casper, who at one point was head of the council, of, he succeeded Bea for the Council on Christian Unity, uh, he, was, he came out and wrote some articles against this analysis. In it. So, so there's tensions. In other words, how does one maintain, and one of the big questions that exist, and even some of the documents from the, from the council, the pontifical council, how does one go about proclaiming Jesus while at the same time engaging in dialogue with other religions? How does one maintain the, 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 the full dimension of what one truly believes while acknowledging that there's truth and holiness in others? And how do you get the balance between that? Um, some documents do that with a certain deafness. This document was a little heavy-handed in the way it approached approached it, but that's that's the development since then, in a, in a quick fashion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And um, the other thing I just wanted to add was the uh, gathering in Assisi last October. Uh, there must have been scores of religions that were hosted at, uh, in Assisi, Italy. Uh, this is something that's become common now with the Pope hosting different traditions where they witness in prayer um, against uh, violence, promoting peace, looking at things that they have in common. It's really, you can see it on the Vatican website it, or in YouTube, it's just magnificent to see uh, Sikhs, Confucian, uh, uh, Confucianists, uh, uh, Muslims, Jews, but religions I'm not even familiar with. And it's really quite wonderful. Before I talk on, does anybody have any questions or anything that they would like to ask Dr. Prusak before uh, this uh, very experienced theologian who actually was at the council? I feel like I want your autograph. <laughs> anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to contribute? Annette. Um, I, I was just very curious by that last document that you read. Um, yeah, I am, I, I am a post Vatican II child. Um, do, do you need me to? Um, my daughter, although I'm raising her Catholic, goes to a Quaker school. And I have learned more about, we celebrate Diwali, we celebrate Jewish holidays, we, I mean, the school celebrates all of these, and it's been a wonderful experience for that. Um, and I grew up, you know, where it was a really big deal when I was like five or six, right around the time of, of Vatican II, to go to my friend's Protestant church. And there was a, a lot of consternation in my family about me experiencing this. And, and, you know, I feel like I've seen the full swing of the pendulum. Um, I do feel like I've gotten a little bit of pushback. Um, you know, when my daughter went to CCD, there was concern that she wasn't attending a Catholic school that she was attending. And I... You know, and I hear things like this in this document. It, it, it is a tension, and I struggle with it as a parent, um, how to honor and respect other faiths. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, there's sort of what the Vatican's saying, and there's what goes on at the level of the parish and education. Um, do you have a sense of, of how we're educating children, especially within our Catholic schools? I feel like I'm, you know, I'm sort of getting a feel for both. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, do, the concern that this document grew out of was the way Jews are presented. And I think hopefully there's been some advances in that. Although shortly after the Council, the American bishops, Catholic bishops of the U.S., issued guidelines for the preaching during, let's say, Holy Week. And I think uh, in some cases those are not given attention in more recent times. Uh, some of the stuff, some of, some of the uh, kind of initiatives moved to the background and faded. You don't have that intensity that they had at this particular time. I remember when I came home from the council, uh, having got my doctorate, I spent, you know, 
every week traveling to parishes, talking about all the liturgical changes, all the changes of, there was, you know, uh, younger people today, I'm sure, don't realize how much changed in the church at that particular point. Um, uh, that, that dimension is faded away, and there were many more ecumenical initiatives at that time. More and more parishes or churches uh, uh, celebrating together, uh, prayer services, etc. It's rarer now than it was back in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, I, think, I think we're in another phase now, and um, I, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which um, we learn to be Catholic in a pluralist world, and that, that, I think, is the experience of a lot of young people growing up today. And then the question is that uh, it doesn't have to be that everything is relative. You can, to, to value one's own tradition and to believe in Jesus does not mean that you have to demean or diminish the others. And I think that's the most crucial element. And I think, hopefully, if that's what's come through all these developments, well, that, that's a very positive development compared to earlier centuries and what was going on in earlier centuries. And so I, that's, a, that's a short answer, but there's a complexity to it. And I think you, you'll find some people are more comfortable with both ecumenical and interreligious dialogue than others, and you find that parishes vary in terms of their perspectives on those kinds of issues, and people in education vary in their perspectives on those kinds of issues. And that's why some attention to the official documents and the official statements but what you also see is how it was a learning experience for the church itself and for the leadership in the church in terms of the, 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 the real efforts that had to be put into getting this finally to come to a, to, a, to a finality and how it was in a way serendipitous that the decision to put the statement on the Jews into a broader statement really led the church into a whole new territory. It's also, I find interesting, that's why I put it in the paper that I read, that, that Pope Paul VI had actually opened himself to this in the two-year period, because that represented a growth for him also, if you look at some of his earlier perspectives. And so I guess I'll stay with growth and hope that it continues and that people uh, keep a different kind of awareness at this point in time. Anybody else? You want to comment on Cardinal Martini's comment oh. that the church, or did you do that while I was No, there? no, no, no. That no. the church, you know, two weeks before he died, which is a safe distance, uh, the church is 200 years behind the times. I mean, that, that was quite a... Uh, well, that's not the first time that Martini has made that type of observation. Um, it has been noted that, for example, Cardinal Martin, he was the uh, Archbishop of Milan, okay, biblical scholar, and the Archbishop of Milan, a very profound thinker and open, uh, much like John the Twenty-Third was, but perhaps even beyond in some ways. But, but for example, on, on uh, <laughs> just to raise a hot button issue again, but on the issue of contraception, he said that the Church could completely, as the, as the papal as the Papal um, Birth Control Commission also said that there, there could be a different perspective and position on that. And so, so he's not been, he, he's, he's not shrunk away from being outspoken in many cases. And um, there, there are other uh, times that he, uh, so some, some had a hope that he might be Pope. Uh, that never materialized, probably because he had always spoken his mind. And, um, uh, that doesn't put you in um, uh, a positive position always among the group of those who are cardinals. Uh, and you could see, you could see the tensions. Uh, the, the, the church itself, um, John the Twenty-Third had a real breakthrough in this. And when he announced that he wanted to counsel, the first time he did this was at the Church of Saint Paul outside the walls. And he told the cardinals of the Curia, their jaws dropped. You know, that's the last thing in the world they wanted was a council for updating. See, and, and that's not the mood of this moment. Uh, and so uh, one can only hope for further surprises. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.